Peter gave a little bit of a, again, a, a broad overview of our Quality Improvement Foundation, but I have asked Andrew Grossman, who is the co-chair of the Improved Care Now Clinical Committee, to say just a few words about one of the things that has really helped take our Quality Improvement Foundation and bring it into day-to-day -day clinical practice, and that is the Improved Care Now model care guidelines. It's not something that we present that often in, in audiences that include parents and patients, but I think it's time to kind of share a little bit more about it so we can provoke some questions. And hopefully some of the clinicians on the call will type in, you know, you can certainly feel free to chat in your observations or other things you'd like to share about the model care guidelines with a broader audience. Andrew, as you introduce yourself quickly, I'm just going to ask you to remind the community what center you are at, um, what your role is at the center in addition to your Improved Care Now role, and how long you've been part of the Improved Care Now network. Okay, well thank you. Thank you, for uh, Sarah, for including me today. And I, I really appreciate everyone being on this call and uh, be, being a part of our, of our community. Um, so my, again, my name is Andrew Grossman. I am from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where I am the co-director of our Center for Pediatric Inflammatory Bowel Disease. I've been involved with Improved Care Now since our center joined in 2010 as the physician lead, and then since the formation of the clinical committee as the, uh, as the collaborative got bigger, I, I have been the co-chair of the clinical committee for, for Improved Care Now. So again, really excited to be a part of Improved Care Now and excited to be uh, here on the call with you. Uh, hope to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of the model care guidelines and then if there are questions, maybe we can answer some of them. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so uh, looking at this, so this is the Improved Care Now Key Driver Diagram, and the Key Driver Diagram is really the essence of any quality improvement project. What is it that you're, what is the outcome you're seeking? What are going to be the key drivers that are going to allow you to achieve that outcome? And then what are the interventions that are ultimately going to determine whether those key drivers are successful in helping you achieve those outcomes? And looking at the part that's boxed in the middle, um, some of the key drivers that we're going to focus on today relate to the clinical care that the patient is uh, receiving in order to try to help with outcomes. So you can see the arrow looking at those. And those key drivers, which you can see, are proactive, timely, reliable care, accurate diagnosis and disease classification, and appropriate drug selection and dosage. And if you think about that, that really seems like almost an obvious, easy thing to accomplish. But I think we've all learned through our um, education and quality improvement and an honest appraisal of how we do that this hasn't always been easy and that's why Improved Care Now has been so successful because it's helped provide a framework for doing that in a more reliable, more accurate and more dependable way. So the model IBD care guidelines were originally put together uh, with this in mind and since they have been um, um, updated uh, in a manner to help um, achieve these goals. So next slide please. So this really is in many ways the, one of the keys to what we are trying to do as a community, and that is create model IBD care guidelines that will allow for consistent, reliable care. Now, obviously, these are not intended to try and help um, determine what the right answer is for some of the controversies that still exist as we try to figure out um, how to optimize a management, but rather to really kind of delineate what are the keys to management, what are the keys to diagnostic testing, what are the keys to documentation that really should be done for all patients to ensure that they're kind of done. So as you're going through, this is, uh, th this is the beginning of the model care guidelines. Um, you can see that it begins with looking at what the complete diagnostic and initial evaluation should be. Um, this is something that was written very early in the course of Improved Care Now, but we've made recent updates. Uh, those updates uh, include um, that uh, if you look that uh, consider fecal calprotectin, the second to last uh, bullet point, that's something that was at, uh, second to last bullet point under complete diagnostic and initial evaluation. 
uh, that's something that one would consider early in the diagnosis. And then at the bottom, also monitoring with fecal calprotectin. So that is a test that's become more prominent um, since we've, uh, in the last few years, and was decided by the clinicians and other members of the collaborative that we wanted to include that. Uh, also making sure extent of disease, the phenotype of disease, basically the classification of disease, the severity that all of these were uh, being documented. Um, if you're documenting it, then you're actually assessing it. Um, again, seems simple, but these are things that we're discovering really makes a difference. And then I think almost as importantly, at least at our center, we found this very helpful, was to actually set what we think the, the minimum visit frequency should be, and then um, helping to determine who isn't meeting that visit frequency and trying to get them to the clinic uh, more expeditiously. Next slide, please. There we go. And then you can see that there are guidelines for treatment with different classes of medication, treatment with five immunosalicylate medications, what your general dosing would be, treatment with prednisone. And, and we reworded this a little bit recently, but basically uh, the idea being that we're trying to encourage clinicians not only how to use prednisone, but how to try and get off of it um, in a way that is best for the patients. And one of the major goals, as was already pointed out on this call, um, is that we want patients to be on as little prednisone as possible, um, steroid free, and so uh, some guidelines for helping to do that. Uh, treatment with thiopurines, what the dosing should be, how it should be monitored. Uh, next slide, please. Treatment with methotrexate, which is another of the um, immunomodulators that is sometimes used for um, uh, treatment of the inflammatory bowel diseases. And then uh, treatment with infliximab, or what you might know as Remicade. Um, you can see that that's a little more extensive. Um, and that is because this is another area that was recently updated uh, by the collaborative, um, specifically looking at uh, dosing. I think over time, uh, some of the data has suggested that using uh, higher doses of this medication is sometimes helpful. And uh, there's been a lot of clinical experience and, and some data which has really demonstrated the importance of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. What that means is checking uh, serum levels of the drug prior to the next dose and uh, ensuring that there's enough in the system um, because if that's not the case then it seems the effect of the infliximab might be less both in the short term and the long term. So now we have given guidelines for actually doing that monitoring in a prospective manner and also um, uh, when someone is having a flare or not doing as well as possible to uh, check that check those levels and possibly uh, increase the dose as necessary. Next slide, please. Uh, same thing with adalimumab, Humira, although admittedly there is a bit less uh, experience and data using the therapeutic drug monitoring with adalimumab as there is with infliximab, but there was enough that we felt it was important to uh, remind clinicians that this is part of model care. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you might be asking, you might be at a center or you might have an insurance company where we, um, where the insurance company hasn't been willing to cover this type of uh, monitoring. Well, that's, uh, that's not a deterrent us in that we still think it's part of model care and our hope in, um, in, in stating unequivocally that we think it's part of model care is that maybe this can be used to help the insurance companies understand that this is uh, essential to the treatment uh, for patients who are on these medications. Um, also added uh, with the recent update is for patients with Crohn's disease who've had a bowel resection. And um, one thing that's been very well recognized in adults is that it's very important to continue to monitor uh, the area where the resection was done following the resection. So we've written some recommendations for that to ensure that adequate monitoring is happening so that we can um, assess our patients properly. Next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, other uh, really uh, keys and key drivers for, um, for this collaborative has been making sure that not only clinical uh, status is being um, assessed and, and paid attention to, but also nutritional and growth status. And you can see here that there are definitions of what we consider to be a satisfactory nutritional status, but also uh, one who's at risk and one who's in nutritional failure, and also the same 
for um, growth status, um, whether someone has satisfactory or is at risk or at failure. And if you look at this, you, know, um, you could probably uh, quibble over some of the uh, demarcations a bit, and we do allow the clinician to use their judgment, particularly when assessing growth failure. If you have someone who's really starting to grow and they're doing better, but they haven't quite hit some of these uh, markers, you can see it's not just what percentile on the chart you are, but also what your velocity of growth is. So that allows for a little bit of um, of uh, someone being subjective and determining how the patient's doing, but it really, uh, for each visit, every clinician is asked to assess the nutritional and growth status using this scale, and again, simply doing it ensures that the clinician is paying attention to it and making sure that, it, uh, that, that it's addressed. So I think this has really made a difference in the workflow and in ensuring that uh, we're monitoring growth and monitoring nutrition in a more appropriate way. Um, I, if, do I have a next slide? I can't remember if I have one more. You do not. <laughs> I do not. Yeah, I thought this was it. Okay, good. So um, that's basically an overview. Obviously, uh, there is uh, there there are more granular de details within this. I didn't want to read the whole thing to you. This is available, as you can see. Uh, the URL is at the bottom of the. Um, of the uh, slide and uh, is available on our uh, website. Um, does anyone, uh, have, do we have time for questions or, or, or any uh, considerations? Or? Yeah, we do have time for questions. If anybody has any general questions, they can certainly put them in the chat box. While we're giving people a second to do that, first of all, I want to thank Andrew because I think you know this is a great opportunity to get the concept of model care guidelines in front of a broader community of people. Um, certainly the intent wasn't for Andrew to read through it word for word, but to point you all to the fact that they are on the internet and when you receive these slides after the call, you'll be able to click right here on this link to go take a look at them. But we'll also show you another way to get to them in a, in a bit. 